Mm. Hello, everyone. So I'm very glad to see you all here. Welcome to the DSS IT Sec 2018. This is the, this is the ninth time this this uh, this event is being organized by by DSS, and and um, uh, this year's theme is the economics of cybersecurity, and uh, in this room we will have. Uh, speakers from from F Secure. I, I thought about some lame jokes. I thought, hmm, our parents usually teach us like, don't use the F word. I wonder if these guys uh, tend to ignore that rule. <laughs> well, the uh, company original name was Data Fellows, which on US slang around that time had uh, some, should I say, rainbow associations. So I think that we went for better direction anyway. Data Fellow, yeah. <laughs> I see. <laughs> so it, it has nothing to do with the F word. So anywho, we have here uh, two speakers from Finland. This is uh, Jarno Niemela and uh, Mr. Ian Whiteside. And uh, I guess I will give them the stage. Good luck. Okay, thank you. All right. So um, we split this kind of in two. I'm going to bore you 20 minutes with a little bit more commercial things. And then Jarno will get down to the deep stuff. But I, I like to normally ask a brief question. When was the last time you were breached? And no one ever puts their hands up, but uh, everyone has been breached. But I'll come back to that in a minute. OK, so we will talk a little bit about our detection response. And then Jarno will go over some, some um, human conducted kind of attacks and, and uh, scenarios around that and have discussion on that. My name is Ian Whiteside, as, as was mentioned. I've been FSecure around 11 years now in different pre-sales and, and sales positions over the years. Um, but what I was kind of, when I go through this, there's three things that if you're not deep into security, at least three things that you should take away from here. Um, and the first one is, is this one. On average, <coughs> you will hear actually different kind of uh, marketing and different kinds of Gartner reports and different Forrester reports, and they talk about 100 days, 190 days, 250 days, different amounts of days that it has to taken a company to notice that someone has owned their network. So someone has bypassed the endpoint, the firewall, and all that. So on average, there's different depending on the vertical of the company. I like to use this one from Gartner. It's an average of 100 days, so it doesn't take into account verticals. But average of 100 days is what typically is the amount of people that or the time that people own your network before you actually even notice. That's the first thing, at least, if you remember that. Then the second thing, a lot of people have a hard time distinguishing between prevention and detection response, and we'll talk a, a bit about that in a moment. In prevention, so we talk about our firewalls, we talk about our endpoints, and we talk about different things that stop the bad guys from coming in. With that, well, unfortunately, the bad guys have a bit of an upper hand because typically they're able to purchase that. Um, I bet you can go to the exhibition here and ask for a quote and you'll be delivered a product pretty quickly. And then they can test against that product to find a way past. They only need to be right once. So they only need to be right once to bypass the preventive layers. When we talk about detection and response, we, we actually change things the other way. So if we look at F-Secure Detection Response Services, there's a human mechanism. So we, it's human and AI and other intelligence. And you can't test that. It's not something you can buy from a shop. So there's no way for the attacker to actually test that beforehand. Secondly, the only thing we need is for him to make one small mistake, and then we can notice that X, Y, and Z is happening within your infrastructure. So that's the second thing. Difference between prevention and detection. I'll, I'll actually come back to that as well. And then this statement, it's, it's getting a little bit old now, but the FBI guy, director at that time, a few years back, he was mentioning that there are two kinds of really companies. Uh, he was mentioning that there are the companies that have been hacked and the ones that will be hacked. But then he actually went, mm, no, actually it's not. Like There's the ones that are hacked and the ones that will be hacked again. So. Getting back to my first question, if you say you haven't been breached, you just probably don't know about it. 
Okay, so from an F-Secure point of view, uh, what we do is we, we have a holistic view of cybersecurity. Uh, many of you maybe know us, we're a 30-year-old company doing antivirus, a word I hate, <laughs> typically, but, but times have changed. So, so we look at the holistic view of security, and, and actually what we do nowadays is we, we do a lot of prediction, so the crystal ball, and, and basically by that we mean red teaming, we mean consultancy, we mean things like vulnerability management, so we have solutions for that, and so do other guys as well. Prevention, so that's about the castle. It's about building the locks on the walls, it's about locking the bad guys on, on the outside. This is something that all of you in security are pretty good at, I'm sure. I know you, you have a next-gen this and a next-gen that and something else, and you're keeping people out of, of the infrastructure. But as I said earlier, everyone will be breached. That's just how it is today. So, so what do you do next? Maybe some of you have a home uh, alarm system. Don't know, but typically there's a sensor, and the sensor will see when someone's inside. So that's more on the detection side. So what happens next? When you see someone within your house, what do you have to do? You have to respond to that somehow. So what we'll talk about here is detection and response, and, and, that, and that's really about when the guys get in through those big walls and gates, the Trojan horse, what do you do afterwards? A little bit um, kind of joined to this is red teaming. So F-Secure has actually the last largest presence in MEA now of, of any cyber security company doing red teaming, uh, consultancy and crime scene investigation. And I'll, I'll talk about red teaming because it relates to this uh, detection response in many ways. So if we look at our red teaming, we've had a lot of really interesting exercises. I talk to the guys now and then. Um, some of them tell us that they've broke into an office. They're paid to break into offices. Uh, and they're making porridge in the kitchen when the CEO comes, you know, uh, things like this. But we've had a lot of interesting kind of missions, if we put it that way. One is breaking in and then being at the CEO's desk and taking a selfie of oneself. Or else we've been asked to uh, take over an ATM machine. Now, how hard can that be? It's just a Windows machine in a metal box, right? So we've, we've done things like this when it comes to red teaming, and we're actually 100% successful in those. And there's a really cryptical link here, and I'll try to share that uh, with the presentations later, because you won't be able to write that, about red teaming at F-Secure. But I wanted to jump into red teaming a little bit, because it's, it's quite an interesting topic, and as I said, it does relate to testing your overall capabilities so that you, you understand that you will need detection response or you will need some, some processes within your company. So with Red Team, I was talking to the guys in the consultancy and, and they, they actually do a lot of interesting stuff, as I mentioned. And We have a academy for, for junior consultants or junior Red Teaming people and they were telling me a little bit about what they do. And one of the things when, uh, when uh, they're training actually, what they will do is they take the phone book or something, I don't know if there's a phone book anymore, uh, just take a random number, call a person, and keep them talking for as long as possible. And this trains people to answer to very cryptic questions. The longer you can keep them on the phone, the better. They do things like this. They also go to Starbucks, or some other coffee place, and, and they have a mission. Talk to five people, find out their full name, and their uh, job. So I, I guess you can imagine if you go to Starbucks and, and someone calls out John's white latte, whatever, oh, I'll go. you go to grab the coffee, oh, you're John as well, and you can start with a natural conversation. So the consultants and guys are doing a lot of these kinds of, of trainings. What's also quite of interesting as well, wh what, what they were talking about is they, I don't know if you have those gates when you come in to work, we have at F-Secure these gates where, where one person can go in by one by one. So typically they, they do a bit of training on that as well, how you pace yourself. Because the thing with red teaming, when you do physical um, uh, red teaming, you need to be at one with the environment. You need to look like you fit into the environment. So when these gates open and close, you can't really run in after that, you know, you're going through the gate and I try to tell, but it doesn't work. You're going to say, hey, who are you? B but if you try that with an apple in your mouth and 60 coffees in your hand, everyone will normally let you in. Yeah? So they're doing things like this to get access to there. And the coffee machine was quite interesting as well. So what the guys were saying is it's a really good place. So lobby you normally has a coffee machine. You can go there, you can make yourself a latte, relax, look around. Okay, there's a door there. 
try your mission, doesn't work out, go back to the coffee machine. So they were saying that the coffee machine is a really, really good place to, s to have your headquarters when you're doing red teaming. And then these high visibility vests, those are great. You put one of those yellow vests on and you, wow, you can get into anywhere almost. It's, it's interesting. But finally on this topic, one of the things they were also saying, if all else fails, they have a really cool thing. It's called a CV. So everyone needs people for their workplace. So they have the best CVs in the world that will get them an interview at any company. So they go to the company, they have an interview, they get into a room and the phone rings. It's the doctor calling about the pregnant wife who has just been suddenly called in and then they say, oh, sorry, could you give me just 15 minutes? I need to talk to the doctor about my pregnant wife who's just in hospital. I bet none of you would say no to that. Suddenly you have 15 minutes in a room of a company to do all kinds of stuff, like Jarno does sometimes. What? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, a little bit about physical. And then if we talk about over the internet kind of things, what these guys are doing. So I, I was talking to them a little bit as well. What kinds of missions have you done on, on that side? So they have went as far as they've set up Egyptian um, like artifact exhibitions where they've sent tickets and brochures in snail mail to somebody who was very interested in Egyptian artifacts. So the guy would get an email, or not an email, uh, a physical uh, letter. Oh, you're very active on social media because that's obviously we done our background. We checked his social media, we checked his LinkedIn, we checked Twitter and we'd seen he's very interested in Egyptian artifacts. So there's a lot of information there. And he gets this letter and it says, hey uh, guys, no, no, you know, you're very into this Egyptian artifacts. Here's a free ticket for this exhibition. Would you like to join? You just need to sign up here and you get your <coughs> free tickets. And of course the guys, yeah, I want to do that. And typically this is C-level guys who are, are we, we target. So he signs up. Obviously by that time it's a bit too late. <laughs> so, so it's a website hosted by us, full of all kinds of ridiculous stuff that shouldn't be there. Um, and, and the guy is owned. And basically to get a clean getaway, he's notified, oh, sorry, we're out of tickets. So that we leave no mark behind us. So those kinds of things. But one of the last things actually, I also find this LinkedIn message. It, it, it's really stupid, but it's something that over 70% of people apparently fall for. Getting a message from LinkedIn, or what looks from LinkedIn, and it says, hey, uh, we have seen that you have done X, Y, and Z. It's against our terms and conditions. We will shut your account in 48 hours. Everyone is, no, I didn't do that. So you click on the button to complain. Too late, <laughs> again. S over 70% of people fall for that. So almost, well, this part of the room will click on that LinkedIn email, which is actually from one of our consultants. So just a little bit of some of the things that, that they do in the background. Um, the threat landscape in general, just to paint, to paint a bit of a picture here, um, we have seen this mass commodity, I don't know if it's about 300, 400,000 samples per day we see of, of these commodity threats, which is automized by machines just pumping out different variants of, of malware. That's quite easily stopped by EPP, it's quite easily stopped by firewalls and, and traditional kind of preventive layer solutions. Um, but then going up the stack, we talk about well cyber crime, organized crime, and there it's typically human conducted attacks where you have non-malware attacks, so, so not f fileless attacks actually may be the better word, so, so attacks using maybe things like SSH or shell scripts and so forth. Very typical things that you will see in environment. So how do you react to those kinds of advanced attacks? And Jarno will go into that in, in more detail. And then nation states attacks. So how, how can you have some visibility if the US attack you? It's quite a big, big uh, uh, example there, but so detection and response really is something that you will need on, on that side. And the other will go in, into more details. And just to kind of emphasize that, if we talk about today's threats, 99.9% .9 of them is the mass malware that probably you hear uh, at the event will hear a lot about. And there you'll have your firewall, you have your endpoint, and that will, depending on who you're using, will clean out the mass majority of those threats. But then what happens when you have a human conducted attack that is specifically targeted at you, so a targeted attack, it becomes much more complex and endpoint firewalls 
they will be bypassed, as I said in, in, in the beginning, and they will do the most damage because, well, I'll come back to it in a minute, but the, because those guys really are after something. And for those, you will need something like an MDR, Managed Detection Response Service, or an EDR, Endpoint Detection Response Service. And uh, this relates to this great marketing term, APT, as well. And why I, I bring this up, which I mentioned just a moment ago, I think there's about those kinds of targeted attacks, <coughs> there's, a there's a few things. So yes, they have access to budgets. They normally have managers. Uh, it's quite sophisticated. They have tools, what they need. But the maybe the most interesting thing is they have time. It doesn't matter if it takes them one day, one hour, one week, one month, one year. They have all the time that they, they need to get access to your infrastructure. And you know why? Because they have a motive. And the motive is maybe to exfiltrate information out of the infrastructure or something else, but they have time and they have motive. And that's what changes the game from these mass malware attacks like the ransomware attacks that have been recently. Okay, I'm going to show you a small video uh, of, of a case. It's quite kind of interesting and, and um, well, we'll talk more after, after that. <laughs> So a very ordinary day, you're having lunch, and you get a call. What happened? I had just my first slice of pizza in front of me, and then I received a phone call that I have an urgent secret message. And what was the secret message about? It was about the security breach. Someone had breached our network and was stealing data. And who told you about this attack? How, who was the secret messenger? It, uh, it was an other foreign state, Ooh. a friendly one. After the notification, what were the next steps? What happened within the organization here? Well, first I skipped the lunch. <laughs> Makes sense. Yes. And then we went to a security operations center mm -hmm. and we took out our network flow. And then we were looking for those facts or data which were uh, written in that document that I was given. And how long at this point the attack had been going on? At least four years. Four years? Wow. Yes. And like, what kind of response did you have to the attack? Like, how long did it take to solve the issue? Well, uh, the first response took one hour. We blocked that flow. And in a couple of months, we had an understanding how the attacker was operating in our network. And then we started to raise our shields more than before. And we enhanced our surveillance in our network. And after six months, we made our all kind of message in one day. So during these days and weeks and months, how did you feel? Well, to understand that we've been breached, that was my worst day of my work life. Why is that? Well, to find out that something that you've been taking care of, that you have, well, didn't succeed. It was unclear. It's the Finnish Foreign Ministry. Um, and there's nothing shameful about this. As I uh, told you all at the beginning, everyone will today or in these days be breached. It's about the processes and how you can react to them. And with GDPR, these things will become very, very public. Uh, we have a very good cooperation, by the way, wi with uh, foreign ministry. But a couple of things about this. Pa apart from he had to skip his lunch, but a couple of things. So he received a phone call to tell him there's a secret message. And this is very typical as well with companies or, or, let's say, governments who don't have detection response. How do you find out about uh, a breach? You're told by someone else, be it CERT or be it somewhere else. And in this case, the Finnish Foreign Ministry were told by a friendly nation state. So they had no clue. The attack had went undetected. I mentioned 100 days earlier. Now we're talking four years. So four years, there was an advanced attack that they didn't notice about. And then after that, it took them one hour just to block kind of the first flow of, 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 of the attack. So only one hour. If they had a knew very quickly about the attack, they could have done that in one hour, not four years. And then in a couple of months, they actually understood how the attack had come and, and what was around that. So it took them a couple of months. Again, if they had a detection response, that would have been already available in an instant. And then it took them six months then to bring up all the levels of security to, to um, uh, counteract this. So four and a half years since the breach it took. And that's a foreign ministry. So uh, as a company, you 
Hmm. It's an uphill struggle. Okay, so more on the detection response actually, what we at F-Secure do, and then Jarno will get into the demo and show, show a little bit how, how uh, uh, things happen there. Uh, one of the things, Tom van der Welle, he's, he's one of our consultants, leading consultants, and, and what he says is if you have visibility over the infrastructure, it makes red teaming, which I talked about earlier, much more difficult. And that's the one thing that most companies lack now is visibility. So I said they focus on preventive flares solutions. So then the companies that do want to adapt, they, they come up with a kind of stack. This is the stack to bring you, build your own SOC or your own kind of environment to deal with these kinds of situations. And typically you'll have the preventive, you have the endpoints, you have the firewalls. So what do you do then? Then people start talking about, oh, I need to buy a CM. Great. So they buy a CM. Okay, we need 24-7 capability. So if there's two million logs on a CM per month, who in their right mind is going to 24-7 sit and look through those logs? So it's not really efficient, but okay, let's assume you do that. You need five people 24-7 monitoring a CM. Next thing, it doesn't really tell you everything. It's just information from, again, the preventive layer. So you would need anyway EDR or incident response, some, some kind of service around that that would tell you if a breach would happen. So then you would invest a little bit more. And all of this is pretty useless unless you have threat intelligence. So, uh, as I mentioned, F-Secure is one of the largest in cyber crime scene investigation nowadays in EMEA. So we have a lot of the, the threat intelligence that helps us wi with this service. But typically, don't take this as three million and five years, but it's, it's just an idea. It will cost you a lot of money and it will cost you a lot of time if you want to develop this kind of solution. And this is, some people will, will do this and some people, well, we don't have three to five years. So what rapid detection service and, and what Jarno will go into in a minute, it actually brings you the capabilities in one week. It's, it's, it's basically, if you would look at it, um, your own team of threat hunters within one week. So giving you the capability, there's an API for CM if you have one of those, but giving you 24-7 threat hunting on current threats, but also historical threats using the threat intelligence that we have. But the most important thing maybe there is, we talked about four years, we talked about 100 days, but as soon as we see a detection, there's a 30 minute SLA that the company will get a phone call within 30 minutes to say, this has happened and here's how you fix it. So there's an actionable information about that. So that's what rapid detection response service from, from Air Secure is kind of around. And typically it works roughly like this. We have number of sensors and the sensors are deployed on, on different kinds of machines. Today we have a lot of IoT devices, cameras and so forth, so there's a network sensor will pick up that. And then we have honeypots or decoys which kind of mimic some kind of servers, uh, also to trap the guys and to, to stumble upon those. And that information is sent about five megs per day to uh, an infrastructure that uses AI uh, it uses a lot of our, uh, let's say, advanced technologies to do real-time detections or anomalies on that. And then, and that's really the most important part of it, when the anomalies are there, the threat hunters, the analysts will actually, as a human, go through those to make sure that you get the best quality of information as a detection. And we have the capability with the big data to go back in history to check, okay, um, six months ago, your data point is here. Now we have a new threat and, and kind of uh, go back on that. And of course, the jobs of the threat hunters, the analysis, the most important thing is when they find something, they of course teach the AI as well so that we don't need to manually do that every time. So if we look, this is a kind of a typical company, uh, two billion data events per month. So this is, I guess, what the CM will see as well. And then they'll have some kind of filtering there and you'll get it down to maybe one billion events and, and, and th that's, that's your CM view. What we do in, in RDS or Rapid Detection Services, we're actually able after the human factor to get down the number to about 25 detections. On average, out of those 25, 15 would be real detections. Okay, there's some false positives there, but a very low amount for the companies that we serve. The RDS Center has said it's, it's humans, it's AI, so it's a combination of both. It's 24-7, open all, all the time. And now, 
as I said, I bet you no one's going to put up their hand and say, yeah, we have a breach ongoing now, but I bet you all of you have a breach ongoing somewhere. You don't know about it. But I will let Jarno actually show you the interesting stuff. About the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll switch the screens. One nice thing about HDMI is that it actually is relatively reliable, so you can do something like this on a live demo. So, welcome. So, <coughs> I'm going to demonstrate a pretty standard hacking scenario, and uh, since we are in public, I will use publicly available tools. So, for this demonstration, I'm going to use Kali Penetration Test in Linux, and I trust that some of you people are familiar with that, <coughs> and on top of that, I'm using uh, Metasploit uh, penetration testing framework and Armitage uh, graphical user interface so that you actually see something else than just boring command lines. So basically our scenario for the attack is that we are coming over a resume. So your standard uh, document based attack, but it could be USB stick for example, so that uh, one of these things that our red teaming does, and we also have encountered in uh, being used by real life attackers, is that they collect all kinds of USB sticks, open them and replace that with their own hardware, usually either using rubber ducky or some kind of custom hardware, and then feeding uh, the attack over key, uh, keystrokes. But unfortunately, coming over keystrokes is a bit problematic on VMware, so in here, I'm just using the document-based attacks. So here we have our victim receiving an email from Mr. Enid Gumby, uh, who is, or actually Professor Enid Gumby, so has to uh, have to be credible, of course. And then I'll just close these windows. So he needs to print that, and then word being word, you kind of have to click enable, enable in order to print that. And that's pretty typical of what happens when you are dealing with documents. So what Microsoft is doing is a blame transfer. So in order to be able to do something with the document, you have to click yes, yes, enable, bloody yes. And that also enables uh, the macro capabilities, which ends up the attacker getting an access in the system. So here we have the attacker having the first beachhead in the system. So he has, let's see what he has right now. He is in as the normal user. So it seems that we have the domain name and we have the username. Nice. But unfortunately, this of course for attacker is not good enough. So the next thing he needs to do is to ele elevate his privileges. So the target is Windows and then environment. And unfortunately, it has a patch, or the other thing is that we could assume that uh, this would be a zero-day exploit. So I'm using a FOD helper vulnerability to bypass the UAC. And this is the most typical thing that attackers need to be able to do, the UAC bypass in order to be able to change the user in the, uh, having system privileges. So now we do get system, and then after that, Let's double check that everything worked like it should. Our attacker now has a syst system privileges in the environment. And this is very typical thing. So if the attacker wants to move away from the first computer, he needs to be able to obtain system privileges. Of course, in order to be able to obtain the system privileges, he needs uh, the bypass. The, so the first thing you need to do in your organization is to make sure that the normal users don't have admin access in the system. Most of the bypass vulnerabilities are dependent on that. So having a separate admin user in the system with unique password per machine already disables most of the USA bypasses and would make it a lot easier. I would have to use atom bombing or some other less reliable techniques. So now the attacker has system privileges so the next thing he needs to do is to migrate from the initial process to a process where he can steal login credentials. And this is Windows 10 environment, so we are migrating to SVC host. And since we are already a system user, this is a relatively easy operation. So now we are uh, having here 
uh, in the SBC host process, and that allows us to use registered uh, registered trick to capture uh, usernames and hashes. So in this case, what I'm going to get is administrator account. So this is the second common uh, configuration mistake on normal environments. You, you typically have your default admin account in the environment, and since machines are cloned from each other, guess what? This password ends up being the same on just about every single one of your computer. This being Windows 10, I was not able to obtain the user's username and password. I might be able to social engineer that by showing some kind of a fake login prompt, or the other trick I would have to do is uh, key logging and then just being patient. But since this is a demo, we are not patient, and we want to go to the other machines as soon as possible. So the next thing I'm going to do is that I'm going to poke around and see what other computers there are in this environment. So there's this nice computer called Workstation 7.1. Let's go have a look, see what's interesting in the Workstation 7.1. Why I would want to go from Windows 7, a uh, Windows 10 to Windows 7 workstation? Yes, and there's exactly one thing that I'm after. And the thing that I'm after is that, as I mentioned, Windows 10 is a difficult uh, operating system for the attacker because you just cannot go and steal passwords from the memory. You can do that in Windows 7. So if you have any Windows 7 computers in your environment, they should be removed as soon as possible. And of course, Windows XP and everything else is uh, really obvious. But Windows 7 is a really important system for the attacker because when he can move into one of those, he has much easier time obtaining the domain admin credentials. So. In here, we now simply select our admin account, which by configuration mistake has all the same password on every image. And then we are migrating ourselves into uh, this Windows 7 machine here. So now it is uh, doing, uh, uh, sending the ex uh, logging in and sending the stager. And after that, I have an access to this machine. OK. Now we are in the Windows 7 machine. And then we have to do the same trick of migrating between processes. But this, since this is Windows 7, I can migrate into winlogon.exe. And because I get to winlogon.exe, I can after that access the plain test pa passwords. And then in here, we are going to encounter our third common mistake that the attackers are making use of. In here, there has been a domain admin logging into the machine for some kind of maintenance operations. This is very typical. You know, your IT staff needs to have an account that they use to log in if they do any kind of maintenance in the environment. And the problem in here is, that if you're using domain admin account for that, and the machine is Windows 7, it can be very easily stolen. And also, other unpleasant thing about Windows 7 is that this password has a nasty tendency to persist in the memory until you reboot the machine. So, make sure that your IT admin has a separate login that doesn't have domain admin credentials for maintenance operations, and always make them reboot the machine after ha they have done some maintenance operations. Now, as that didn't happen, I have now domain admin credentials. This is very nice. So, with the domain admin credentials, we are going to poke further in the environment. So we have interesting computers like file server. So we go and check our file server. Okay, sorry. That, of course, is NS lookup. By the way, this is something that's very typical for the attacker. Typos and mistakes. And especially if the typos are done with system account. That is very, very indicative 
that somebody is, uh, somebody is doing something stupid in the system. System accounts and system processes don't do typos and they don't do mistakes on command line commands. So now we have the IP address of our uh, now we have the IP address of our file server. So let's go there. So we are going to migrate the file server, and then in the file and to the file server. We are now going with uh, this wonderful new domain admin credentials that we were able to obtain. So here we are with domain admin, uh, logging in with domain admin credentials. And then we are here. And then okay. One of these things that has to be very careful is to type type uh, the uh, domain name correctly. We auto generate this demo environment and uh, do it mean lazy. We and making sure that we don't get conflicts. We use uh, random domain names, which are sometimes not so funny and not so fun to type in. But here we are in uh, the file server, and from the file server, the next thing is that we are setting this as our local command and control server. And then from the file server, we are then migrating ourselves in the domain controller. And the reason why I set up this, uh, why I set up this uh, local command and control server is that now I'm routing all of my traffic through the file server. Because servers are trusted objects, and then file server ad accessing domain controllers is more much more likely to be missed than an workstation accessing domain controller. So now we are accessing the uh, file server. So let's do here, or oh sorry, the domain controller, and we are going to get our access there. So, and after this, I have taken over uh, this environment. And the next thing is, of course, that we I'm not only doing a hacking demo, but I did, did need to generate some events. So, and then we'll leave that, logging the domain controller, and see this from the defender point of view. So. Since I am having a bit of network issues with my laptop, I'm using a prepared data set that I generated yesterday. So don't worry about the timestamp. But this basically is how this looks like for the Defender. So do note that I did not use malware at any particular point. So depending on the quality of your EPP product, it might have been able to prevent the initial, initial intrusion, or then it might have been that uh, basically that's it, and the attack would have been completely visible for traditional antivirus. Our EPP is very good, and it does prevent most of these uh, I I attack methods, so that would have been significantly more difficult for me to breach in. Actually, right now, I don't know a single way of bypassing our EPP, because as soon as we figure out one, we will fix that. So the, pur the purpose of EPP is keep the attacker out, but then in case that fails, then you need a monitoring service like this. So basically, when we are looking at the attack in here, we can see the alerts generated by our system. So we have basically three different level of alarms in here. First of all, we have medium level of al al alerts in here, which already uh, causes our uh, in-house SOC staff to investigate whether this could be a false alarm. And if the alert could, cannot be ruled as a false alarm, then we are connecting the customer. And then if it's a red, then we then we make sure that we connect the customer contact the customer within 30 minutes so these are basically uh, going to go through a brief verification check that we don't have a system fault and if we cannot indicate a system fault then we are alerting so the and here basically the first high alert that we got from the system was from a process that is a powershell 
The interesting bit in here is that this particular PowerShell is being started by Windows Word. Why on earth Windows Word would be able to start PowerShell? There absolutely is no defendable business case for that. And for example, if, if we would try this with our EPP product, it would say, nope, you are not going to try that at in the first place at all. But if you let's say that you're using some free AV or then uh, Microsoft building AV, this probably would still be a very effective way of pre uh, preaching true. So in here we have the first alert and then how our system works is that when it gets initial alert, it will start tracking everything that is even mildly suspicious that that particular program, all its child programs, has been doing. And that then allows us to see these kind of cases. Like, for example, we are seeing suspicious network connection. So this is right now in the internal IP space, obviously, because this is a demo environment. But in real environment, this would be of uh, most likely going to somewhere within the internet. And then we, when we are seeing PowerShell doing these kind of network connections, and the PowerShell already being indicated to be suspicious, it, all, it goes all in the tracking. So we are able to track the ne connections done by any suspicious processes. And then, in addition of that, we can see the attacker doing operations in, in this particular machine and then moving to another machine. So here we have the switchover from the first workstation to the second workstation. And then from the second workstation, we can see the switchover to the file server. So we are all the time able of seeing where the attacker is moving, and also we are able to see what the attacker has been doing in the environment. But if we need to drill down further, we can actually get a an, uh, an, uh, step-by-step uh, uh, process tree and track what the attacker has been doing. So in here we have the PowerShell. This PowerShell is the one that was being executed by Windows Word. So, it hasn't been doing anything really uh, all that suspicious by itself, except that it has been launching another PowerShell process. And then, this particular PowerShell has been busier. It has launched CMD four times. First of all, why on earth PowerShell would launch CMDXE? CMDXE is a shell, and PowerShell is a shell. So why we have shells within shells? This is not very typical for a program, uh, for normal PowerShell to operate. So let's see, in here we have something very interesting. So it's, it's calling who am I? Who am I by itself looks at, uh, is a quite innocent command. But this particular one will tell in which groups the user belongs to. And this is something that is done by Metasploit and many other privilege escalation kits. They are using this particular command to figure out whether the user is belonging to the local admin group, because that is what you are going to get as an output from that. And then, other thing that is a really strong indication that we are dealing with uh, some kind of an out a scripted tool is that that particular thing is being called multiple times. When you actually start reverse engineering attack toolkits or reverse engineering their behavior, you'll notice that they are very sloppily written. Of course, what the guy could have done is to store the information in the variable and not to call it multiple times. Why on earth human would call who am I and exactly the same who am I multiple times? So do we have anything else interesting in here? So then in here, we have Windows calling FOD helper which is one something, or we have a command line calling FOD helper, which is kind of interesting. Why on earth they would be calling that? And then FOD helper by itself is calling itself. And in here, what we are seeing is that one of these leads further. So, let's see which one of these tracks we are dealing with. So in here, we are having launching PowerShell again. And, and it, 
this already is way beyond any normal behavior baseline. So as we can see, our baseline rating, where is which, which is one of the machine learning environment, machine learning systems we are using, where zero means that it is within the baseline, and 110 is already out of the zero to 100 scale. So this kind of thing has never been seen on any kind of clean environment. So we are able not only to track it like this, but our AI has been able to all the time telling what kind of things are normal. So for example, PowerShell calling CMD it has a popular, it has a baseliner score of zero. So that kind of thing does happen in normal clean environment. But then CMD calling FOD helper happens pretty much never. FOD helper calling itself happens never. FOD helper calling PowerShell happens never. So this is something that the attacker is has a very, very difficult time circumventing. Because they have to do things in the environment that are not normally being done. And when you are able to track those efficiently, then you can see what are the things that are abnormal anomalies in the system. And especially when you have anomalies in scriptable components, it is a very strong indication that somebody has been preaching in your environment. And in this way, we are not dependent on signatures. We are using signature and rule-based systems on creating human readable descriptions. But at the same time, we are able to operate completely within anomaly detection models and then seeing what has happening here. And then other very lovely uh, thing that we are seeing in here is that we have normal user suddenly becoming a uh, system. How would your regular user be able to spawn a process with system privileges? So this is the second part of the privilege escalation that we are seeing happening in here. And then we are seeing one other scripting hoster and then launching CVTRES and basically this already is uh, ba building a local component in here. So CSS and CVTRES are .NET local compiler components and we are seeing that the attacker is compiling uh, uh, compiling further payloads in the environment. So this basically is what allows us to track the attacker. So we either can operate on a, a detection based model which already tells us and is able to identify what kind of operations attackers are and these are the detection based model is really useful for the fact that we can then build an automatic descriptions on the things so that we don't have to go to the event-based forensics all the time and this uh, gives us a broad overview of the attacker actions because many of the att attacker actions even if they, are, if they are using custom malware memory uh, scripting components, fileless attacks, memory injections or anything else, the operations they have to do in the environment are pretty much the same, which then allows us to create automatic verbal descriptions of the attacker actions. But in case, if they would be doing something that is completely novel, then we can track the attacker by the behavior or behavioral log. So we kind of generate an automatic forensic trace of the attacker. So this was um, something that was very welcome for our, incident, for our incident response consultants, because if they are doing tracking this kind of information from the memory dumps, uh, uh, from the process launch histories and uh, other logs, it will take hours to build up the information that we are able to compile on real time when the attacker is operating. But then as I was mentioning, the fact that uh, uh, endpoint protection is also a part of the solution in saving money for you. 
So let's have an example of a case where uh, uh, and, uh, the user has some proper endpoint protection installed. So in this case, we are using a scenario where the attacker has been social engineering the victim. And, he has and the victim is told that he needs to install two-factor authentication component uh, from uh, Gemalto. So I cloned the Gemalto site, and then our victim is trying to install uh, the mobile pass two-factor authentication component, which was packed with uh, Shelter, which is one of the better obfuscators out there, which is able to produ produce an obfuscation that uh, AV cannot detect, provided that you're not using some well-known payload like Metasploit. And then, in that case, we were still able to detect that particular attack based simply on behavior analysis. So, let's have a look on here. So, basically what happened was you, you cannot execute the file and the reason why you cannot execute the file is that, let's see, recent events, our deep card local AI was able to uh, detect this uh, by suspicious behavior. Or if we would try, let's say, uh, I'm going to simulate uh, the command line based attack. So this could, for example, come in USB stick. In this case, we are just running a bat file but that basically emulates somebody typing something in with the command line and once again we are able to prevent the initial intrusion into the system. So while obviously an endpoint protection is not a complete solution anymore this day and age, and high quality endpoint protection is going to save you a lot of money in incident investigation. So we are saying that we have 99% protection rate against uh, attacks. And that means that the 99 point, ca 99 point ca cases where you don't have to spend money on investigating because the attacker doesn't get in in the first place. So, that basically concludes the technical part of the demonstration. Uh, would you, uh, do you have any questions? No questions. <laughs> Unix-like system, that depends very much on the system itself. Right now, technically, they are much worse than Windows when it comes to security. Windows guys have been kicked in the head for past 15 years. And they kind of not like it, so they are spending enormous amounts of money on securing the environment. So, if I would take your standard Linux distribution, it's much softer target than Windows-based environment as soon as I'm able to social engineer a victim to run some kind of code. But there's much less attacks, so it all depends whether you are an in interesting target or not. If you are not an interesting target, you are pretty safe from your common criminals because they have much better income from, uh, let's say, over sex or Windows-based victims. But if you are an interesting target, then Linux by itself does not provide significant protection because Microsoft is spending enormous amounts of money in securing their components, and that does show. So, for example, memory protections, uh, behavioral protections, injection protections, they are far more advanced in Windows-based environments. On Mac, the biggest problem is that the user feels to be invulnerable. And that means that they are pretty easy to fool. So, and also the other thing is that Apple uh, is using denial more as the for the security strategy rather than hiring enough security folks. So, while Windows is being attacked a lot, uh, while Windows is being penetrated a lot, if we are looking just from the technical point of view, as long as it's maintained up to date, and you don't do basic configuration mistakes, it is very good. Uh, we have six ah. more. Yeah, I will give you the mic. Yeah, hi. Um, in, in this scenario you showed then that attack is already got to the system and then uh, you've got to notify customer in a half an hour is understood, yes? Yes. 
what the customer should do after that? Well, first of all, we are providing instructions. The basic thing is that the first thing we always figure out is that where the command and control centers are. So these network events, as we are saying, for example, here, this suspicious network connection, these are the first things to go after. So you check where the suspicious process is communicating, and you kill that within your router. So you basically null route that particular destination. And then you watch the environments like a hawk to spot any secondary command and control channels. Of course, the other thing is that isolating the environment is a very good idea. Doing uh, incident, well, basically, it all depends on what kind of, what, I what is the security level wanted by the customer. So it can be as simple as closing down the affected systems, restoring them from backup or nuking and rebuilding. Or the other option is that if they really have to know exactly what happened, then uh, they can order our incident response consultants who will go, in, uh, go on site and perform traditional forensics investigation and provide an incident response service. So it depends very much on what is the importance level of the customer from their point of view and how much energy they are willing to spend on making sure that they know exactly what happened and then making sure that they can fix the root cause why the attacker got in. Yeah, so in the RDS service you get a phone line directly to the consultants who can help you through the process. Yeah, and then what level the process is preferred? Is it only restoring operation and uh, re recovering the infected systems? or whether it is a full, full investigation, why this happened, root cost investigation, etc. That is within the customer preferences and how much money they are willing to spend on that particular incident, which is really why the EPP is so critical. So with, uh, with the EPP, you are going to have very few successful breaches, and then you can spend money and energy on figuring out those, rather than having those every second day. We probably have time for, for one more question before the coffee break. Anyone? Yeah, gentleman down there. Uh, I'm pretty sure you know your competition. Maybe some words. What are the alternatives? In, in the MDR space, this service? Yeah. Uh, there, there, well, I don't know, I don't know, do you want to mention, there's not too many actually in mm -hmm. service provider. Well, <laughs> that's pretty much is so, to be honest, I don't track the service space that much by itself. Uh, we obviously keep, uh, for example, Carbon Black is on our radar, Cyber Reason definitely, and then of course, some traditional AV houses has also been uh, creating these kind of an EDR and MDR services. But of course, the one thing is that uh, very few do it the way we do. So the thing is that F-Secure is a large company and we also provide red teaming services and we red team ourselves all the time. So we provide both the attack and defense services. Of course, the attack services are provided only for your own organizations. We are not mercenaries. But I would say that since we both do attack and defense, there are very, very few like us who basically know exactly how the attackers go. And many of the companies are pretty much dealing only with the defense and they don't develop attacks by themselves. They don't research zero day vulnerabilities. They don't preach systems. So it's a bit different. I think that the closest one for us was MWR Countercept. We bought them. Yeah. <laughs> That's very true. And, and just to add on to what you're saying, um, it is becoming a little bit blurry. I was in Jitex last week in Dubai. There's 170,000 people there. But there are a lot of vendors talking about detection response for the smaller customers, so, so as, like a, as a product kind of thing. And, and they talk about detection response, but it's very different than what we talk about with RDS, where we have the human concept and we have the threat hunters and we have the analysts. So it's, it's good. <coughs> understand marketing will start very soon to play a, a role in this and, and make it very blurry for everyone. So 
do your research, understand if it's just machines making decisions on their own, or you have also the human touch, and then understand your budgets and your needs as well. And also one other thing is that uh, how experienced the company is on using AI. Any fool can use AI nowadays, as it is provided by <coughs> it is provided by Amazon, for example. There's full machines, kits, kits. You have your Sparks, uh, yeah, and etc. But the thing is that it's very easy to build something that over normalizes, and that means that the biggest problem in AI is filtering out the clean behavior. And unless you know how you filter that properly, you end up in a situation where attacker who mimics clean behavior will be normalized out so that the machine learning system is not being able to detect that because he's using the similar file names to clean system, similar directories, similar command line structures, etc. So it is very, very difficult to use only machine learning so that you get both fo low false alarms and you get into a situation that the attacker is not able to mimic clean behavior and that way uh, bypass the whole detection mechanism. It's really easy to get to the over-normalized uh, over -normalized situation. We have done that many times. We built a wonderful AI, okay, it we had too many false alarms. Okay, let's reduce the false alarms. What the hell, we are preaching this true. So, it is not easy. Any idiot can build an AI nowadays. You just take your ready-made libraries, get some data, pour it in, shake a bit, and hey, presto, there's your AI. But it, it's not going to be very useful. Just one last thing, because he's going to throw us out in a minute. We're out of time. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, 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 yeah, if there's any questions afterwards, uh, we're, we're around here, so please come, come and ask. Yeah, I was just about to say that I'm sure that Arno will and Ian will, will be happy to, to answer any of your <laughs> questions privately. Uh, I want to thank you both for, for uh, giving this wonderful session to us. So from from DSS. Thank you.